Kelsey McCalla. Um, she is she is a PhD. She's a PhD in Kent Dane's lab, uh, Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. Um, and today she's going to be presenting on manipulation of ground covers for control of the three-cornered alfalfa hopper and other suspected red blotch vectors. Welcome, Kelsey. Let me um, meet you. There you go. And go ahead and you can share your screen. Great. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Okay. Let's see. Okay, has that pulled it up? Um, can, yep, you're in presenter view. Great, perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Um, as Cindy mentioned, I am a, uh, my name is Kelsey McCullough. I'm a postdoc in Kent Dana's lab at UC Berkeley. And today I'm going to be talking about a study that um, we ran in 2019 and 2020 uh, in which we examined uh, manipulating ground covers in the vineyard um, and uh, looked to see if that had an impact on uh, three-cornered alfalfa hopper um, uh, populations as well as other uh, potential red blotch vectors. Okay, so um, I think as it is very clear, red blotch uh, threatens the U.S. wine industry, which is worth more than $160 billion annually. Um, on the left here, we can see uh, a leaf from an uninfected vine, and on the right, we can see uh, the blotchiness and uh, um, red venation and a red blotch infected vine. Red blotch negatively impacts uh, both uh, vine, vin uh, vine vigor and uh, ultimately the dissolved solids and uh, sugar in wine grapes, which uh, ultimately leads to reduced yield and uh, reduced quality of the final wine product. Um, now, red blotch spread, um, as uh, Mark was previously discussing, um, has spread through infected nursery stock, but also we do see movement within vineyards, which suggests uh, an insect vector or multiple insect vectors. So here's a study <clears throat> in which the, we can see the red is, uh, the red pluses are where um, <clears throat> we have red blotch infected vines. And then um, we kind of radiate out from that point in 2015 and then through 2016, we can see spread within established um, vineyards in California and Oregon and other regions. Now we've had a few, uh, quite a few candidates uh, for the vector over the years that have been examined. Uh, of course, the major one is three-cornered alfalfa hopper. In previous studies, it was found to be 15% uh, positive and 50% positive um, of the samples that were of the three corner alfalfa hopper samples were found to be positive for the red blotch virus. Um, of course, this insect requires legumes to complete its development and to reproduce on. It's an opportunistic feeder on the vine that moves to the vines once the ground covers um, or any leguminous uh, plants in the area are depleted, found in uh, relatively low to moderate abundance in the vines later on in the season. Um, and we have multiple studies now that are showing that uh, Kika can transmit the virus. Um, with the most recent one, Slavsko et al. 2021, uh, 20, uh, showing a 10% uh, uh, transmission rate from uninfected vine or infected vines to uninfected vines. And then there's another insect that the Dana lab has been looking at for the past couple of years, Scaphotopius brenaticus, which, um, <clears throat> excuse me, has been shown also to carry the virus, not necessarily transmit. We had to look at that part. Um, it prefers the vines. It has a high affinity for the vine canopy this is where it reproduces, it's, it's where it feeds. We don't see it in the ground covers. Um, 
And the most interesting thing is recently our lab has preliminary data, <clears throat> trans has, we've conducted transmission studies which suggest it is capable of transmitting the virus from, or from infected to uninfected vines in five out of seven vines. Now the virus is notoriously difficult to work with. There's always possible contamination. The replication is low. And so before we come out and uh, share the details about the study um, and the results, we are um, finishing replications and are being extra cautious with absolutely everything. So um, I won't get into the details of that today because we are still working on it, but um, we have some you know, we do have some evidence that Scaphotobius vaticus uh, may be spreading this in the field, uh, in the lab, and potentially the field. And then we have another of uh, a number of other insects we've looked at over the years that have been able to test positive for the virus, but have not uh, yet been shown to be uh, vectors. <clears throat> so what it what we do know <laughs> is what we don't know. We know that uh, the relationship between the vines, red blotch virus, and insect, the known insect vector and potential insect vectors is still unclear. We're looking at the insect's phenology, um, how they move in and out of uh, the, the vineyards from the ground cover to the vine canopies um, and, and how, what this looks like over a multiple year period. So pesticides are uh, one option for managing pests, um, but they may not be the, the best solution. They may be the best solution. They're not necessarily the only option. And so we should look at other alternative management options, including cultural control practices. And in this study, we looked at management of the understory of the ground covers. Um, and so typically after harvest in fall, um, and then uh, the ground covers are planted for soil management purposes. Um, and reduce uh, erosion and also to restore nitrogen back to the soil. Typically ground covers include a mix, at least in the north coast, include a, a, a mix of um, grasses and uh, legumes. And so we wanted to see if we remove these ground covers, these leguminous ground covers in the vineyards, could we potentially um, reduce the three-cornered alfalfa hopper populations? And in doing so, potentially have a, a, um, a management option for red blotch. So we conducted a two-year trial in uh, North Coast vineyards that had red blotch documented and documented spread. In 2019, we had five field sites and we looked at them on a, a, a twice per month from June through October. And then things had to change a little bit in 2020. Um, as we know, 2020 was a uh, particularly challenging year. We didn't have the, we had, we're under COVID restrictions, we didn't quite have the same um, manpower. And so we weren't able to sample all five sites. We selected the three that had the, um, had the uh, highest number of insects in 2019. Um, and we sampled earlier in the season, so we went out in April rather than June, but we were only able to sample through September due to fire restrictions in the area. Um, and luckily, none of our field sites burned down, but one of them did catch fire. <laughs> so we were very grateful that it's still standing and, um, and, and, and that the growers were able to make it out uh, with, with minimal damage. But it was kind of chaos. So at each site, we um, divided a, a plot of land into 10 different blocks. Each block, uh, block was made up of five rows, five vine ro uh, vineyard rows, and then we randomly assigned it a ground cover treatment, whether that was mow or disc. So this is an example of what it looked like, and then there was a barrier of one row in between the different treatments. Okay, so what is mow versus disc? Well, um, in the mow only treatment, the grower only mowed, and this happened in early spring, so in May of 2019 and 2020. And um, so they periodically mowed the understory, which maintained a short um, but continually growing understory um, until summer dry down. 
And then our MO and DISC treatment, which we will refer to as DISC from this point forward, the growers went in, they mowed down the vegetation, and then they tilled the soil. And um, this completely eliminated the ground covers and they, they didn't come back. I mean, every once in a while we would see, you know, a weed here or there, but for the most part, it just eliminated the understory. So there are no more ground covers. And then we monitored these rows twice per month um, for pest densities. So how do we monitor the pest densities? Well, we hung yellow sticky traps from the top trellis. And um, again, we changed them out twice per month. So we left them out for two weeks and we went and picked them up, changed them out, left for another two weeks and so on and so forth. So we could continually monitor um, act, pest activity in the canopy. Um, in 2019, we also sampled uh, the ground covers with sweep nets um, when the ground covers were available. Um, however, again, due to staff uh, shortages in 2020, we were not able to continue. And because of the relatively few insects that we picked up, there were Tika, um, but the, the relatively few insects we picked up overall with this method, we did not continue for 2020. And so the publication I'm talking about, ultimately we didn't, um, uh, there was no replication, so we didn't want to include those data. And I don't have them today, but it is something that we did do and something that hopefully we'll get a chance to summarize at some point. Okay, so another difference is in 2019, we were examining uh, pest densities at multiple uh, multiple um, points throughout the canopy. So we looked 10 feet, we looked at 10 feet away from the edge of the vineyard, 75 feet away from the edge of the vineyard, and then 150 feet from the edge of the vineyard. So we thought there might be an edge effect. Um, Tika could be moving in from the ground covers, but potentially they're also coming in from riparian or uh, oak woodland areas that are adjacent to the vineyard. Um, and so we might see them, you know, we might be able to catch them actually dispersing throughout the vineyard, but we did not see an edge effect. And so again, with staff shortages in 2020 and without a significant difference, we condensed down to one um, sampling point. Okay, so did management of the ground cover ultimately impact uh, vineyard pest densities? So um, I'm going to be talking about three-cornered alfalfa hopper, uh, Scathotopius phoneticus, and then western grape leaf hopper, which is not a vector. It has tested positive for the virus, but it's not a vector, but it is a pest, and it was found in very high densities throughout this um, uh, across the, the course of the study. And so I will be talking about it as well. And again, all of this uh, information is in the, the publication that uh, this presentation is based on. Okay, so Western Grape Leaf Hopper. Okay, before we talk about Western Grape Leaf Hopper, <laughs> leaf hopper um, I just wanna outline what we're looking at here. So on the y-axis, we see the average number of insects collected per month. On the, the, the x-axis, we have the month that, was, that the that sample was taken from. And then we have this dotted line, which divides 2019 and 2020 data, 2019 on the left, 2020 on the right. Um, I'd like to point out here that we did sample two months earlier in 2020 than 2019. So both these points are uh, looking at June 2019 and then June 2020 respectively. So there is kind of an offset on the right, but again, that's because we sampled earlier. And then the uh, number of insects found in yellow sticky traps in the disc um, rows are in orange. Um, so actually the colors don't stay consistent throughout each insect, but they are, uh, the darker color is always disc. And then Mo um, is in the white. Okay, so now that we're through that, uh, overall Western Grape Leafhopper was the most common pest that we recovered. We saw um, peaks 
in July and August, both in 2019 and 2020. And overall, we did actually see an effect of treatment. There were more um, Western grape leaf hoppers in our disc rows than our Mo uh, rows overall. Uh, why did we find this? Well, um, adults do uh, like they are, they can be found in the ground covers early on in the season, in early spring, and so eliminating those ground covers potentially push them up into the vines just like it would uh, Tika. However, they're adults earlier on in the season, and so it wouldn't necessarily stop, and, and they do develop in and, and reproduce in the vine, so it wouldn't it would wouldn't stop their um, their populations from increasing. And this could also be a response to increased vine vigor. So typically, disking is done um, at this point because it's not beneficial to have that understory. The plants at that point are competing with you know, nutrients and and most importantly, um, water and the soil stability is not needed at this point in the year anymore. So eliminating that increases, the, eliminating the understory increases vine vigor and that this could, the increased number of Western grape leaf hoppers could be a response to, uh, to that. Okay, Scaphotopius granaticus. Um, so Scaphotopius was the second most common pest that we found in the study at about 5,200 individuals total. Um, we did see overall higher populations in 2020. This was a, a pretty clear effect. Um, and it's possible we do see differences between years naturally. Um, but uh, again, when we selected the sites to continue with in, or in 2020, we selected those that had the most pests. And because this is, you know, a, a pest that's common, um, potentially that could be the reason why we saw increased numbers. Um, so we need to look at more studies to get a, actually a better idea of their populations. But the trends overall are still useful. So we saw a peak in May in 2020. And again, because we did not actually sample this early in 2019, we actually missed that peak. And then we did see a, a peak in the late summer or fall, depending on whether or not you look at 2019 or 2020. So again, uh, we have other studies that are ongoing to, to better investigate the, the trends, the population trends of this insect. Overall, we did not see a significant impact of ground cover treatment. And this isn't surprising given that Scaphotopius has a strong affinity um for the vines and actually we have colonies in the lab and they that we have established that we established it's probably been there for about a, a year and a half probably probably about two years now and um it continues its development year round of course these are in you know in, in optimal conditions but they will complete development and reproduce on the vines. We keep them on, on, um, on vines in the lab and they absolutely destroy them. So we don't know the overwintering biology of this insect in the field, um, but that is something that uh, can be investigated and we're working on that right now. Okay, so finally, three corner alfalfa hopper, the insect that we know is a vector of red blotch or the red blotch virus. Uh, overall, we did not find very many Tika throughout the study, um, but again, that could be a product of, you know, where we were sampling, um, and uh, it doesn't take too many insects to transmit the virus anyway. So overall, we saw peak populations in July and August in 2019, as well as 2020. And we did uh, luckily see a significant impact of treatment on Tika populations. So in our disc treatment, we saw five times fewer uh, individuals overall than in our Mo treatment uh, on average. So really great results here. This makes sense, again, because they're completing their development in leguminous ground covers or any legumes that are in the surrounding vegetation. Um, and only then, once they complete their development, and 
those and we have like natural dry down or removal of those leguminous uh, plants do we see movement into the vine canopy. So removing all of the vegetation here is, is definitely going to be better than re removing only some of it because we're still leaving them a reservoir if we don't uh, completely eliminate the vegetation. So and early on in the season, in the season, um, in, in early on in spring, teak are still completing their developments, um, and so we can target them as nymphs. They can't get away as well as the adults could. So <clears throat> going through and disking would eliminate those, and then any future reproductive uh, or any any future basically breeding habitat. Okay, so there are other insects that in the in the past have tested uh, positive for the red blotch virus. Again, not necessarily, not, not vectors, not still under testing, but we did not see an effect of ground cover treatment for these insects. And so, and um, for the last one, Caledonis, we didn't even get enough individuals to accurately examine the impact of treatment. And, so this makes sense. Um, populations of these insects, such as with Colodonus reductus, the populations are peaking too early in the season for, the, for that to really make an impact. Um, and the other three, too late in the season. Um, and there's probably a bunch of other little explanations for each one of them, but we really need to, uh, we would really need to repeat the study and try to capture more individuals to actually um, I, I think have a, a solid understanding of their movement in and around the vines and the ground cover and to see if this is could be useful for them. Okay, but the big question is, was removal of ground cover via disking in May um, in 2019 and 2020 effective in lowering populations of red blot known red blotch virus vectors and potential red blotch vectors. Um, and for Tika, that answer is yes. As I just mentioned, we found five times fewer Tika in our disc road than our mode than our mode only rows. Again, they require legumes uh, to complete their development. We can kill the nymphs early on in spring by completely removing that ground cover. Um, and avoid adult dispersal, which would, and, and the adult peak, which typically happens in July and August. For scaphy, no, we did not see a difference. Um, we find them basically only in the vine canopy. Uh, they're found in large numbers in the vine canopy throughout the growing season, but, so we wouldn't expect this to impact them. And we did find two peaks, um, one early in the season, one late in the season, to really pinpoint that, um, I think we would, we, we have ongoing projects to better investigate the phenology of, uh, of scaphi and other um, vineyard pests. Okay, so to conclude, well, we think that this provides evidence that spring disking um, is a great alternative management uh, practice for managing Tika populations. Um, it's something that growers are already doing. Um, sometimes they will leave the understory and only mow, but uh, disking is a common practice as well. And although mowing, you know, down the vegetation potentially can still leave some habitat for natural enemies, um, it can also leave some habitat for pests and it does compete with the vines. So uh, this is something that I think growers will, would willingly add to their management strategy. And this can be part of a comprehensive IAPM program for the three corn alfalfa hoppers. So we can combine it with other things. Okay, so obviously there are uh, a few drawbacks to the study, but uh, the biggest one that I see is that it was limited to sites in the North Coast. And of course, over the years, we've done a lot of work in Napa and Sonoma. Um, and this provides excellent information for Napa and Sonoma, but as we know, there are uh, vineyards all across California and uh, major wine producing regions that are outside of the North Coast. So we wanted to run a study where we looked at this regional variation in red blotch vector populations um, or other major vineyard pests. So a study that we're running that we started um, 
last year and that is currently underway um, still uh, into next season. We're looking at trying to get a big picture uh, of red blotch and associated insect pests across California. Um, so we want to look in differences in pest densities across different regions, years, and seasons. So is Tika more common maybe in the Sierra foothills versus the North Coast? Do we see a trend? Um, and we also are employing multiple sampling strategies. So previously we had sweep netting, but primarily we use yellow sticky traps. And um, in this case, we are using yellow sticky traps, but we're also using vacuum aspiration with, with evacs at least for um, some of the data. And this is a really large study. So this is um, an ongoing effort between our lab and um, the uh, Dana lab in Kearney. So in total, we have 32 field sites and we're looking at, uh, we've got five in Napa and Sonoma, seven in the Sierra Foothills, five in Lodi, six in Livermore Valley, five in San Luis Obispo, and then uh, four in Paso Robles. So um, this is a, a huge undertaking, but we're really hoping this gives us some uh, more dialed in information about these pest and vector populations in different areas. And this can hopefully inform the timing of management practices uh, going forward. Okay, so um, that's it. I'd like to just thank um, the, uh, of course, Kent and, uh, and, and Houston, UC Berkeley and UC Riverside, our cooperators at UCCE, um, Alexis, who is the first author of this um, paper, and uh, she is um, on maternity leave right now, so I am uh, talking about it in her stead. Um, of course, our support team at UC Berkeley, uh, both staff and undergrads, vineyard managers, growers, uh, and other cooperators that allowed us to use their vineyards, um, <clears throat> except when they were actively on fire, which is reasonable. And then uh, our funding sources, USDA NEPA Specialty Crop Grant. Okay, and with that, feel free to contact me uh, if you have questions that I'm not able to answer today um, at this email provided, and um, I'd be happy to field your questions. Thank you, Kelsey, for your presentation. We have uh, two minutes for questions, and we do have a question that Michelle will read to you now. Yes. Uh, what was the ground cover made up of? Wouldn't this have uh, an effect on TCAH populations, i.e. perennial non-host grasses versus legume cover crops? Um, yes. So in our... Right. In our, uh, I'm trying to remember, <laughs> it was a combination of, there were a couple different types of clovers and uh, we had purple vetch. Um, yeah, there were a number of grasses, um, oat, barley. Um, I can give you specifics, not off the top of my head, but um, yeah, the ground cover composition, another option for ground cover composition is just to eliminate the legumes from it. Um, of course, the reason why legumes are included is the nitrogen fixing and, and bringing that back into the soil. Um, so in the paper, it, we, we do have um, everything that the growers planted, all the, uh, all the specific species in the composition, but um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question, but if you're looking for the specifics, um, the paper is a better reservoir for that information than my brain. <laughs> there, there is one more question, but we do have one minute left, so I'll read it quickly. How many yellow sticky traps per treatment were used in the study comparing the effects of mowing and disking? How many yellow sticky traps per, per, treatment? per treatment? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so it differed between the first year and the second year. I believe we were bringing back, oh, two, three, times 10. I believe we were bringing back, sounds like so many though. Um, I want to say it was 690 
yellow sticky traps per site because um, there were three different areas sampled in the first year. Um, and that was for 10 rows. So yeah, and we and we did replicate it. So I think no, so I think it was it was um, 60 per site per sample sampling period the first year. And then we reduced it down to 30 the second year. Um, Thank you. I think we're yeah. out of time. Perfect. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Much. We can look at the. Uh, we, it's been a while since we since we did that. We can look at the publication. Should include the sample size. But great question. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Kelsey, for your presentation today. Um,